playing Tim Russ today. And I'll do that about as well as Chuck Todd did. So don't get excited. I'm one of Ruby's co-founders and our acting research director. And that's really all you need to know about me. I'm excited to introduce our panel, though. First up, Alan Minsky is the executive director of Progressive Democrats of America, which you may have noticed shares an acronym with Lauren Boebert's organization, Public Displays of Affection. Alan's PDA, however, is a national organization dedicated to promoting progressive values and policies within the Democratic Party and the wider politics of the nation. As an activist for four decades, much of Alan's career prior to PDA was in progressive journalism, including as a founder of LA Indie Media, a program director at Pacifica Radio, a creator and producer of political podcasts for The Nation and Jacobin Magazine, and as a contributor to Common Dreams, Truth Dig, and other publications. Next up, Marilyn Wren is Chief Program Officer with the Coalfield Development Corporation, which should not be confused with a coal barons organization, but is actually a nonprofit based in the coal fields of Southern West Virginia, from where they have pioneered businesses and social enterprises in so solar energy, sustainable farming, construction, deconstruction, and other alternatives to the coal industry. As a West Virginia native, Marilyn has worked in community development for more than 30 years, including as associate director at the Center for Economic Options prior to joining CDC in 2016. Lastly, our very own Anthony Flacavento, whose name I never get tired of saying. He is also a co-founder of Ruby, our executive director, an excellent chef, a two-time congressional candidate, and an all-time good guy. Please welcome our panel with muted applause. We're gonna jump right into a few high level questions about the Rural New Deal you're all excited to hear about. And then there will be tons of time for audience questions, which you can start putting in the chat as soon as Alan begins answering the first question. Alan, to you, mm -hmm. from, a, from a progressive's perspective, why a Rural New Deal? Thank you for this uh, forum and for all that Ruby does. And, you know, the first the first easy answer to that question is something that's very obvious when we talk about rural politics in the United States, which is uh, progressive. Of course, the progressive movement is uh, affiliated with the left wing of the Democratic Party. And as we know, um, the Democratic Party, in a moment, I'll explain to people where I am at. And I apologize for the loud announcements that people are hearing. I'll guess where I am. Um, but the um, Democratic Party has almost evaporated across rural America. I mean, obviously, in, in uh, vote after vote and district after district, um, you get 25 percent, 30 percent voting Democratic. But of course, in our first past the post system, it creates situations now where I think going into this last uh, election cycle, 2022, the um, North Dakota state legislature had 80% Republicans, and they were able to expand that up to 87.5% Republicans. Uh, so there, there's this disconnect where progressive politics speak to the issues of Americans in a very direct and forthright way um, across um, certainly ma major metropolitan areas, the urban core, um, and you know a few other locations across the country, um, you know, college towns, et cetera. But the progressive movement needs to be responsive to concerns of the republic of the, of the people across red state America in rural and small town America. If the Democratic Party is not doing so, that should have no impact on what progressives do. We all know that in America right now, there's deep endemic poverty in a number of spaces and areas broadly defined. It's clearly um, still endemic in the urban core. Um, it's very pronounced in the Southeast in America, in the Dixie, as it were. It is also very intense among indigenous communities across the country. And we all know now, unless we have been, had blinders on, that it is very intense across rural and small town America. As a progressive committed to the economic welfare of all people, looking for social justice for all communities, first of all, is it just an absolute obligation to not abrogate our responsibility and to build a policy platform that is responsive to the needs of the people in rural and in small town America, 
There is absolutely no reason, given the vibrancy of the economy and how hard people work across rural and small town America, that there cannot be broad middle class prosperity in just pretty much across the entire country and certainly in rural and small town America. And again, the, the society is well aware of the endemic crises in small town America and rural America from the opioid crisis on down. But, you know, Main Street after Main Street after Main Street in small towns of the United States has been desolate. And obviously some are still very beautiful, but that's a minority now. Most small towns in the United States have gone through, you know, the wall martification of the region, the just uh, collapse of the vibrancy of these beautiful main streets that used to define the communities. And again, we have monopolization of agriculture, um, destroying family farms really decades ago, and then just being fully re-entrenched across recent decades. And the progressive left has answers to these things, very strong and solid answers. And so on the one hand, there's a void created by, okay, if the moderate neoliberal Democrats, the corporate Democrats are just going to completely be non-responsive to uh, the crises of rural and small town America. Not only is it an obligation for progressives to do so, but, um, you know, it's, there's absolutely every reason in the world in terms of a political lift for our movement and a really political obligation for us to present a platform of programs uh, that is in the spirit of, of what progressive left progressive, whatever you want to call them, politics are, uh, that, that are designed to put money in the pockets of working people to lift up and build middle class communities across anywhere in the society and the world. And that's what is inspired the rural New Deal. The political moment calls for it. And I think we have an ethical uh, and moral obligation to present this uh, with as much um, effort and lift as we possibly can. Masterfully said, Alan, and I think we can all appreciate the urgency your setting, your current setting is bringing to this discussion. Well, as you can see, I'm in the beautiful um, organic environment of the Los Angeles uh, International um, Airport, um, Terminal 5, actually, as I'm flying to St. Louis for the DNC meeting today. So I apologize for my setting. I apologize for the loud interruptions, but I will go on mute now. And thank you. No, very good. Anthony, tell us about the process of producing this remarkable document. What informed experiences or otherwise this rural New Deal? Yeah, thanks, Cody. So it started when Alan came to us, came to Ruby and me and said, um, we recognize much as he just said now, we recognize that uh, the progressive movement has not always prioritized rural or hasn't spoken to rural in a way or with priorities that resonated and we need your help. We need help from a rural based organization to figure out how to get this right because it is a priority. So that was the that was the beginning. Then Alan, along with Dave Alba, who's uh, a farmer out in Oregon and somebody who runs um, or sort of coordinates PDA's work in Oregon, Dave and Alan and I started having weekly meetings kind of developing drafts, fleshing them out a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more, blending my experience, which is around a lot of time in rural, a lot of rural development, with the, the larger progressive framework. We got to a point, maybe two and a half months ago, something like that, where we had what we thought was a reasonably solid draft, still lots of room. And then we turned around and sent it out to folks. Uh, folks all across the country. Dave has contacts in indigenous communities in the Pacific Northwest and elsewhere. I worked with my contacts with people in central Appalachia, as well as in Arizona and other places. And what we got was kind of a, um, <clears throat> I guess, a, a truth, uh, a little bit of a fact check and truth telling about it. We, we took the feedback from ultimately more than 20 people all of them rural based, um, some more political, some more focused on community development and kind of said, here's what we're doing. Are we getting it right? What's missing? What have we misconstrued? And that feedback was absolutely instrumental. The, the good news was that virtually everyone, and these are some people who've been around the block a few times, thought it was fabulous that we were undertaking this, that Ruby and PDA were doing this. And the feedback generally was very positive. But then we also got specifics. We got specifics about pieces we were missing, things we should flesh out more, uh, things that didn't quite make sense or add up. And all of that then fed into the next couple of iterations before we put together the final draft, which is what um, folks see now or, or have at their disposal. Thank you, Anthony. 
Marilyn, can you talk to us about how the Rural New Deal dovetails with community development? How does, for instance, your community development work utilize principles like the ones in this document? Sure, sure. Yeah. And it's really interesting setting in the middle of uh, of, of Trump, Trump country here in, in uh, West Virginia and the work that we're engaged in has such a uh, um, so many points of intersection with progressive progressive activities. Um, um more uh conservation focused uh more climate resilient some of these these factors that you think about uh being more aligned with progressive ideals than you know really uh uh deep uh non-progressive ideas so what what we're finding works in terms of having conversations with folks in uh areas like we're working in um is that it the thing that that I like about this so much is that it is uh, tangible. There's so many tangible pieces to it. And we find that that's what it takes to have the conversation um, and that you can you can get people's uh, actions really aligning with more progressive ideals, even if their their cognitions don't. And it's kind of fascinating. So, you know, when we're working with communities, um, uh, uh, around some of these transitional ideas, we find that uh, you know, just a few minutes ago, Alan, you were talking about you know one of the things is is about getting money in the in the pockets of people in the central part of the the nation, right? In the middle class, trying to figure out ways to do that in places where there aren't a lot of jobs and there's not a lot of good jobs, <laughs> and taking the steps to build these jobs through social enterprise through other mechanisms, it really takes. Um, that type of tangibility to help people over that hump of of this like uh, tribal identification. And until you can do that at the community level, you really uh, there's you know, still barriers that are very hard to overcome. With the model that we're using here at Coalfield Development, I'll just tell you very quickly one of the things that's fascinating. Um, we are working in the heart of the billion dollar coal field down in Mingo, West Virginia, one of the, the, the reddest places on earth. And we have worked with that community enough that we are now installing solar panels on top of the Mingo County High School, whose mascot's the miner. <laughs> I mean, it's like you can't imagine this place. But we, we've, through our tangible work, We've been able to get folks to take actions that align with the, the New Deal, even if the people are coming to terms with this their own identity and this own transition, but they understand what's good for their community, they understand what's good for their children, and they understand what's good for their pocketbook, and the fact that new jobs are being created in these sectors that can help them do exactly what you're saying, Alan, find more dollars in their pockets at the end of the month. So the tangibility of it, the speed of it, and the fact that people can connect to it on different levels, cognitive, but then also emotional and, the, and, and financial, I think that that's a really good intersection. Yeah, thank you, Marilyn. You've already touched on a couple of questions we got in the chat about how to reach out across the aisle here. Uh, so we might circle back to that in the audience question section, but but good to preview it there. And we've got a personal connection to Mingo in the chat too. Uh, Anthony, what is the kind of the 10,000 foot view point of this document? Another way to ask that might be, what principles tie this document together? Sure, there are some principles that tie it together and they're right up, they're stated up front because um, the constraints of this document were that we really wanted to uh, keep it short enough that everyday people who aren't policy wonks, which is most of humanity, could read through it and get something out of it, could retain something. So in that effort to be brief and as practical as possible in our recommendations, we thought it'd be good to lay out some sort of founding values or principles. So I don't know if I have time to touch on all of them, but it starts with the reality that, that solutions to rural problems, and for that matter, problems everywhere, must come from those communities. They must be adaptable, flexible, et cetera. So the, the normal view that most Americans, not just in red country, have of the, of the federal government is it's top down, it's cookie cutter. If you get money, there's nothing but strings attached, right? That's kind of very common issues. It's a bit 
of a stereotype, but there's truth to it. But in our efforts with this Rural New Deal, we we emphasize that 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 doesn't work. That doesn't work anywhere, but it sure don't work in rural places. What the federal government needs to be doing is finding the people who know how to fix problems and create new alternatives like Maryland's group and many others. And they need to invest in them, but also create kind of a um, an environment where those folks are supported and can grow and expand. So principle number one is it's got to be locally driven and, and the federal effort has to adapt to that. Um, the second principle that we highlight in the Rural New Deal is that it's, it kind of relates to that, is that farmers, business people, the kind of social enterprise innovators like Cofield Development Corporation, worker advocates, locals, they all need to be at the table in designing these programs. Again, another issue that's been a problem with both state and federal uh, programs for a long time is even when the basic program is pretty good, then the folks on the ground, especially in the hinterlands, what they get is kind of the um, the mandate to implement a program without having input into the particulars. How's it designed? Who does it target? What do you need to know to know the pitfalls to avoid? Well, the people on the ground, the farmers, the business people, the entrepreneurs, et cetera, they know that. So a second principle is we got to get them at the table in the design phase. And there's a question in the chat about, um, you know, what's the what's next step around implementation? That's part of it, is taking this big framework to communities who are trying to do this kind of thing and letting them design out the particulars. Um, third principle is around the fact that we need these policies to be worker focused. And that's in, that includes farmers and farm workers, but worker focused. Too much of what we do as uh, as a country and as a body politic kind of has workers in the mix, but it's not driven by the needs, the opportunities, the skill sets uh, that workers have. Fourth one is we really want to find the best solutions, whether we're talking about people responding to the opioid crisis or the lack of healthcare access in rural, affordable housing, or whether we're talking about new economic opportunities like Coalfield's doing. There's a lot of folks all across this country, thousands, who are developing some really amazing solutions. This says, let's find them, let's invest in them, and let's help create other innovations like that. And then the last is that we recognize that across all of our pillars, which again range from, from supporting farmers and land-based businesses right through to affordable housing, there's certain things we got to be trying to do in every one of them, like reversing corporate concentration, fighting back against that extreme economic and political power, like building durable wealth, not financial wealth, not abstract wealth, but things that actually have value and will last, like addressing generations of racially based exclusion and discrimination that have removed wealth, whether farmland, home ownership, or whatever, from from millions of African Americans, Native Americans, and others, and and several other things. So that's kind of a sense of the underlying values that Ruby and PDA are are putting forward here. Thank you, Anthony. Alan, is this Rural New Deal a wish list type document for you, or is it a more practical sort of what can we get done in the current politics set of principles and goals? For instance, a reader noticed that you don't call for a single payer healthcare system in the Rural New Deal. Why not? Well, um, for PDA, and I suppose I can, I should, I can make this clear. This is obviously a standalone project. It also fits under for us an. Um, a broader framework of our calling for a 21st century economic bill of rights inspired by the second bill of rights speech that Franklin Roosevelt gave and the final state of the union speech he was able to give during his life. And this is something that has, you know, gained some prominence in recent years. It sort of was almost forgotten for a few decades. Michael Moore unearthed actually the footage of him giving the speech um, for the film capitalism, a love story. And it sort of ends with that. Um, and, um, you know, this was a very prominent uh, component of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, the left wing of the Democratic Party, 
in the post-war years. It was adopted in the 1960 Democratic Party platform. Martin Luther King supported it. Um, you know, there's obviously the efforts at full employment policy in that era. And of course, it all falls away with the Reagan under Clinton era of neoliberalism. And um, so there, the framework of the 21st century economic bill of rights from a PEA perspective, that clearly calls for single payer universal health care at the federal level. Um, you know, I think um, what we do want to have here is also a document that allows, it doesn't have to be taken in totality. To advocate for it in its totality, we of course encourage, clearly. But at the same time, there are policy proposals and programs that are presented here that almost all of which can be advocated for independently. So, you know, given obviously the political lay of the land as it is right now, if there are spaces where the, you know, maybe uh, some good results in some elections or maybe just some persuadable elected officials allow for the consideration of these proposals independent. Um, I think that's one of the beautiful and elegant components of this proposal is that many of these proposals, if not almost all of them really, uh, can be pursued uh, both for, um, you know, clearly improvement and even at full achievement when it comes to a focused policy. So, um, yeah, that's the way the program is designed in this case, the, the, the document is designed. Thank you, Alan. That's clear. This last question is really for all three of you. I'd like to hear from Marilyn first, then Alan, then Anthony last. What do you hope to accomplish with the Rural New Deal? Yeah, I, what we hope to accomplish is the continued just trans, transition of our formerly fossil fuel-based economy, which has excluded so many from opportunity and has completely unraveled the fabric of our small rural communities. And in that unraveling, however, there is this opportunity to stitch it all back together in, in this way, in this, this progressive way that can do all, you know, all of what we're talking about here, bring people more, more into the economy, generate in, increased sustainable wealth that sticks locally, that does combine um, envir more environmentally sustainable practices uh, that completely transitions through uh, bringing in folks doing uh, land-based work um, that have uh, you know social, environmental, and economic um, bottom lines attached to them. So, you know, we are in a, just a, um, an incredible moment and the time is right for this. And in the vacuum of, of other solutions, you know, this has a chance with practitioners on the ground and really listening to the people involving in, them in the design process, this really has a, a, a chance to, to be the, the basis for how we go forward. Marilyn, thank you. That was, I think that's going to be the clip from this interview. That was fantastic. Um, well, I mean, uh, that was that was fantastic. And I do want to uh, add that, of course, the uh, aspects around the climate emergency, clearly, obviously, uh, rural America and its uh, incredible agricultural productivity um, and small towns are central to um, the strategies to reverse what we've been doing to the planet uh, and endangering all of our species and all the species on this planet right now by changing the climate in the way that we are. And I actually had the opportunity to meet with, and I won't, I won't want to put words in her mouth, but uh, a very prominent and celebrated, um, you know, sort of environmental theorist uh, after the climate march in New York, where I was recently about two weeks ago. And uh, actually I, I got there just as after she had been meeting with uh, Naomi Klein and Bill McKibben. So this is sort of a, a kind of person who, who operates at that level. And, and I uh, really would have loved to have seen the three of them together. I mean, not to name drop, and we also, by the way, I'm of course very much want this to be democratically motivated and not just a bunch of thought leaders driving it. But I, I, I got the opportunity to tell this person about this project. And, um, and uh, she focused on the issue of regenerative agriculture and asked if it was a part of the document. 
And I go, yeah, yeah, it's in there. I'm sure it's in there. And of course, there it is in pillar 1.3, right? And that goes to my earlier point that I just made about how there are so many component parts of this that are so brilliant. And um, again, that can be motivated without the whole con the whole platform being uh, adopted. But it's certainly at its core has some very, very concrete um, elements that address this existential crisis. Um, and then, you know, the United States, we shouldn't be shy ever about the, you know, whether we like that fact of the American empire, uh, the still sort of hegemonic role of the American consumer in the global economy, that is a reality and it has been for a few decades. People do look to this country for innovative uh, responses to crises and we really can step up. And of course, the role of rural and small town America is major. Okay, I wanna point to one other thing that I haven't mentioned yet, which is, and I think we all know this is true. And yesterday, of course, in the House of Representatives was a clear example of it. Not only that the Republican Party is, is pretty wacky, but that we are in a crisis of democracy. And it's a major crisis, and it's not contained to the United States. But as, and for all its flaws of our democracy, you know, we're the we're really the oldest uh, established uh, representative democratic uh, government. Um, I mean, Switzerland has a claim to that, but I think ours is more nationally cohesive than theirs. And, um, and obviously, we we have represented across the world that we're a flagship society and government for democracy. And we see the rise of the far right and authoritarian governments across the world. You know, shockingly, if you roll back just 30 years to where we were supposedly were at the end of history and liberal democracy had, you know, as the, as the you know, sort of neoliberals and uh, uh, the chap who wrote that theory were, were promoting at that time. Um, and um, you know, after the Cold War had ended, but now here we are only three decades later in a serious crisis of democracy. A major component to what propels that forward is the sense that people across the country and working people even in, in you know, major metropolitan areas have a sense of contempt uh, that they, they feel the contempt coming from uh, people who, given their educational background and class background and access to um, sort of uh, achieving in a, a meritocratic structure of the neoliberal economy that's largely not one that really provides for real social mobility, a sense of contempt for people across rural America and small town America. And I got, I've always had nothing but solidarity with the people across rural and small town America. As they express that, we know that some of the expressions, of course, um, go, go past the point of anything that I can endorse. But for the balance of the people across all of the working class communities in this country, um, on balance, I hear them on that. And the idea then again, that we do not pursue policies that, that put the best of, of any political formations thinking into the welfare of all communities. And again, exactly what Anthony said about, you know, this is of course a, a broad architecture and structure, but it has to be one that at its core allows for the guidance, especially the way that things are implemented on a day-to-day -day basis from local input. And that, of course, accents, again, full respect for the voices and lives of working, working people across this country. And I see no other way of salvaging American democracy until that day comes when this just an absolute mitigation of the sense of contempt coming from this community to that community. And I think uh, if people are expressing that they feel contempt, um, then and, and they do glob together the Democratic Party into that. As, as responsible people who are working inside the Democratic Party and inside the progressive community, we have to do everything we can in our power to work against what they're feeling and try to present to them in a way that's fully respectful as equal participants in the democratic society. And I think that's one of the best things that we can do to salvage our democracy in the society. And therefore, personnel just requires. Thank you, Alan. Anthony, bring us home. Sure. I mean, you know. Like pretty much everything I've done in my life, I'm hoping that this will transform the world. That's always my goal. Um, maybe maybe not when I'm cooking, but pretty much the rest of the time. But seriously, I, I kind of have three goals and they're of equal importance to me for the Rural New Deal. One is I wanna get a lot more resources in the form of better programs and policies into rural America. There's a lot going on that's good now that a lot of people are not aware of. People like Maryland certainly are. But the reality is that all of the shining stars like Coalfield are generally struggling with resources. So it's either they don't have enough resources or 
the nature of the programs, it's really hard to access or they come with too many hoops to jump through. So one enormous thing would be is if the Rural New Deal could build on a lot of other really good things that are already happening through the Biden administration to dramatically increase the amount of resources going to rural revitalization, rural renewal and addressing problems and do it in a way that puts the power in local hands. That would be a phenomenal outcome. That would be one. Second would be that the general public change its view of rural. There's just too many people, a lot of them smart, highly educated progressives and liberals who are clueless about rural, who think it's a wasteland, who think the only people left are old people and homophobes and bigots. And part of Ruby's mission, but part of what the Rural New Deal can do is show people that in fact, there's a lot of revitalization, renewal. There's a lot of scrappy efforts of groups and people and businesses with minimal resources making enormous progress on rural problems and issues. So we want to lift that up. We want the Rural New Deal to be a vehicle so that millions more Americans shift their focus from let's give up on rural to, oh my God, there's a lot going on and we need to be cultivating that. The third thing is that the progressive movement led by PDA and the Democratic Party embrace this and say, yeah, we screwed up. We've either neglected or hurt a lot of working class and rural communities for too long. And this is one of the vehicles to start to shift that. Those are those are my uh, modest goals for the Rural New Deal. Modest indeed. That does it for my questions. We're going to go to audience questions now. There's a bunch in the chat that are great, but also please raise your hand and I will uh, get to you if I can work technology. Um, the first one, there's actually a pretty lively discussion <clears throat> that, Marilyn, you kind of touched on it already, uh, but here was the, sort of the, the the first question in the thread, can the rural new deal have appeal to those who identify themselves currently as Republicans, even Trump Republicans in rural America? How do we make that happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there, there is appeal, um, you know, that I just want to circle back for just a half second that, you know, so much of the, the anger and frustration that's being felt in rural Anthony, you just spoke to it so well, it's um, the sense that, um, you know, the, the, the content, the, um, just the not understanding what has happened with, with rural places like Appalachia, not understanding the extent to which wealth has been bled from this region through, um, you know, structural inequities that corporations have pushed, you know, for a long time, just, you know, that frustration, the rage, the, um, the impotence of, the, of not being able to take control of, of the situation. All of that's really real. And I love the idea of talking about that and owning the part of the conversation that has just doubled down on that to make people feel like they don't have power. So in order to help people uh, move away from you know an ideology that is not sustainable and is not healthy for democracy, um, giving people that sense of power back and that sense of agency and being part of the conversation is crucial, is crucial. And I think offering people that with a lot of understanding and a lot more, you know, reflection about what has been going on from a policy standpoint and how hard it is to re-embed wealth into places where it's been blood for so long, um, there is tremendous opportunity there for uh, the conversation to go in a different direction. And to engage people who who aren't identifying, you know, with progressive values right now. If you I take off the labels, if you take off the labels, what this is actually saying, I mean, this whole thing written in a different way, people, I think people broadly agree with. Right. So if we can just get past that, we'll we'll be taking a big step. Thanks. That's good, Marilyn. I'll just add one short thing, which is that the particulars of it, most of them, not all, I think would get broad support from at least traditional conservatives and Republicans. I'm, I'm not sure about the MAGA crowd, even some of them. A lot of emphasis on small business, on, on investing in family farms to use the best practices rather than penalizing them. You know, all that, that's very kind of 
Republican stuff in a lot of ways. But I think where we're going to not get support from the Republican Party is I already saw one comment after one of the op-eds that somebody said, oh, this is just more big government disguised as something different. So that response that anytime the federal government gets involved, it's a disaster. I think that's going to make it a harder sell. I think the, the details people will glom onto, but the, the bigger picture might encounter some resistance. That's where the tangible examples come in the on the ground tangible examples of what this work can look like and how it can lead to an economic small town revival around you know, sustainable enterprises like solar installation, like what Solar Holler is doing as a social enterprise. That's why those tangible examples become crucial. And, and I'm sorry to keep jumping in, but somebody in the chat asked about examples. And we at one point thought, Dave and Alan and I, that we would have an accompanying document that listed a bunch of examples, but we realized that was a pretty big undertaking. So we see that unfolding as part of the implementation phase, that we keep gathering these examples from across the country to exemplify this. Uh, you know, actually, there's a couple of things there. One, I want to say a little bit about Trumpism, per se. Um, I do think that uh, one of the things that's distinct about, say, a Donald Trump versus um, the previous two nominees of the Republican Party for president, Mitt Romney and even John McCain, right, is obviously uh, his anger, his expressions of anger. His, uh, I mean, remember, he, 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 his inaugural speech, he said, it's a wasteland out there, right? And um, by the way, I, I do really appreciate the, the fact that there are so many constructive projects going on across rural America. And um, and really across the whole country, you know, not just in you know the kind of like uh, warm and cuddly uh, you know uh, liberal uh, places that are also rural like Vermont. I mean, certainly across the country, I've been surprised actually as I've traveled around the country, um, as I've met with people who are activists, and uh, you know the, the marvelous uh, places I've been brought to and projects that I've seen being developed. That is very true. But on mass, overwhelmingly, you have you know obviously still the reign of uh, industrialized. Uh, often monopolistic agriculture, um, and um, the the. Um, but anyway, with Trump and the expressions of anger, I have felt that his base um, is available for alternatives. Now, some of his base is not, but I don't. I don't think we should throw out um, the um, um, all of Trump's base. And, and don't forget, even as recently as 2016, you had the phenomenon of people saying, "I like Trump and I like Bernie." Right. And that was very widespread across the country. And it was, by the way, we also know Bernie Sanders did spectacularly well in 2016 in that extended set of primaries across, um, you know, red America and rural America, red America, except the southeast, he obviously before the southeast. Um, so um, but Nebraska, West Virginia, all these places, Bernie really swept families there. And I believe his uh, his programs that, you know, obviously uh, we're not as specific as what we produce here, but have clear overlap. I do worry about the use of New Deal in this case. Um, and, you know, obviously one of the reasons I, I champion that is, is is sort of in the wind right now. We have the Green New Deal. Uh, there was a candidate in North Carolina who I liked a lot last cycle, who unfortunately lost her primary Democratic candidate, um, who, uh, you, who did have a rural New Deal uh, proposal in her in her policies. But um, I think the other thing about Trumpism and the Republicans, in the reign of the Republicans across rural and small town America, in this regard, a little bit similar to West Virginia, they're not going to produce any of the positive social change that we're outlining here. The Republican Party, um, I, you see a little bit of bending going on in their policies now around these, this front, uh, because I think their hand politically is such a losing hand when you have the defunding of education, the, the you know, so many public educational institutions are so bad, the housing is so expensive, all the, all the things that are addressed in the 21st century economic bill of rights and in the rural New Deal um, that, the Republicans, the, the crises of rural and small town America are not going to be addressed under this regime. We are proposing concrete proposals that will directly address and bring about greater general prosperity. We clearly advocate for the return and the vibrancy of small businesses, by the way. Anthony correctly says this is, is, a, is a document that foregrounds workers. But, you know, one of the things that's easier in rural and small town, and this is just a general perception, but I think it's accurate. I think the national public has more of an appetite for supplementing the wages of agricultural workers up to a living wage 
than a direct federal supplement to businesses in suburban and in urban small small businesses. And so that's included in the document. And um, I don't think that people will reject that kind of federal program um, assisting uh, family farms and small businesses and new businesses across rural and small town America with that kind of supplement to income so that the workers can have money in their pocket and have a living wage. So I think this, per, you know, for the crises that do exist, and they really do exist across rural and small town America, obviously concentrated in some regions more than others, but really a clear sense of dissatisfaction that gets expressed in Trumpism as this angry howl, but an angry howl with no policy proposals to improve much of anything at all. The traditional Republicans have just let this develop as it's developed with no nothing to really improve things. We clearly have proposals to improve things. I think we can gain traction and we can actually bring those voters over to this vision. At the Rural well, Urban Bridge, we are hip to talking to Republicans. Yeah, I do want to say this. I don't think it will be easy. I do think the cultural barriers are very real. And one of the reasons I was so thrilled the first time I ever heard Anthony and Ruby give a presentation was because they were so clearly experienced in that realm about the reality, almost the materiality, hard materiality of this cultural divide being a huge barrier to progressives and to um, to um, the Democrats, even more broadly, making traction across rural America. But we do have programs that will improve people's lives, and none of the other political, for major political formations in the country are proposing such programs. I, I'm just going to jump in here, just real, real, real quick to respond to that too. You know, talking about you know the worker focus. I think sometimes that the situation in in rural America, in places of persistent poverty, um, you're talking about workers. In, in some of our counties, the worker the uh, worker participation rate is around 30 percent. So even like some some of the the uh, the work <laughs> around workers can be like like a framing that's sometimes difficult at the community development level when you realize that labor rates participation rates are so low. So even you know so we have to to be really thoughtful about you know what that means. So if you're concentrating on workers and labor rate participation rates are indicating that 60% of the people aren't engaged in labor, how do you then build a bridge to that? Because talking about, you know, supporting small businesses, that's important, but, you know, making sure that that the work and the and again the tangible ability to get people there is in place too, so it doesn't just sound like more you know, it sounds good on paper, but what does that really look like for my com my community that's been devastated by the, the decline of coal mining and an opioid epidemic that's been going on for a decade? You know, so like it's it's that it's 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 that level of of, of engagement that's really going to be necessary to get this to work. That's great. I think Susan has had her hand up for a decade. Susan, you want to come off of mute and ask your question? Thank you. Um... I just want to say I've read through it. I really appreciate um, that you're talking about issues beyond agriculture, um, that a lot of people have that brain that it's just all farming, farmland out here. I live in Oregon and um, we're kind of the rural heart of CD5, which is one of the um, really crucial congressional races next year. And so I've been trying to share this with people who um, are living, who live in more urban areas in our congressional district. Um, and I'm just kind of curious um, for Alan going to the DNC meeting, if um, you're going to be presenting this and talking with um, Democratic officials about this um, and, you know, uh, what you might be anticipating um, if there's going to be, uh, I'm, I'm sure Oregon people are, will be on board. I can't really speak for them, but um, it seems like a, something that will be popular nationwide because it's not just ag policy. So I'm just wondering what you're going to share and um, if you're going to be talking with the rural council there. Yeah, um, you know, there is um, a body and a, something with the name of along the lines of the Rural Caucus. And um, um, I'm going to try to find the chair of that body and provide them with the document. Um, now, we are sort of just getting going on our, we have a sort of, you know, uh, 
pre-existing structure for introducing this to people through our candidate questionnaire for candidates, through our chapters across the country at the grassroots level. But also we we have a body that PA was, was founded, it was, it was an idea I had too, of, build, of bringing all the national progressive caucuses of the state Democratic Party together. And just today, um, through the Progressive Caucus of the West Virginia Democratic Party, the entire West Virginia Democratic Party adopted in resolution the 21st Century Economic Bill of Rights. Now, that's something that Harvey and I introduced about you know a year ago, uh, and we decided we were going to pursue that through this means. Massachusetts passed a resolution, Arizona passed a resolution, West Virginia was the third, we're three for three. We look like we have two other uh, states coming forward soon should by, by the end of November, including a very, very, very large state. And then from there, again, with actually West Virginian uh, Selena Vickers, who maybe some people on the call know, we are interested in, in introducing that resolution to the Democratic Party um, next year, conspicuously in Chicago. I think we'll do that. I'd love it if we could do that for the Rural New Deal in Chicago, too. So, um, yes, we, we, have a, we have a means for introducing it around. We, have just, we will shop it around through, in fact, Anthony, sometime soon, um, well, we had you on that. We had you on that call, right, Anthony? Uh, the state Democratic Party, or was that not one of the meetings we had you on yet? The, the Progressive Caucus uh, group. Because I brought you on to a few meetings through PDA. If you haven't done that, we'll do it again. And of course, it'll be time for us to try to get state Democratic parties and progressive caucuses to endorse it. So yeah, we'll be bringing it all around the country. Quickly adding one thing to that, I've been in contact with Kylie Overson, who is the chairperson of the Rural Caucus of the DNC, and she's excited about it. And she said that their November meeting, which hasn't been scheduled yet, um, she will plan to bring it up and ask me to say a little bit about it. So I'm hoping that helps us get in. Great. And could, actually, um, if, you, if it's possible, Anthony, maybe I'll talk to you tomorrow and I'll try to meet Kylie in person during this. I suppose that's the person I would have been looking for. Kevin, I was just about to read one of your questions from the chat, but I'll let you jump in with your own voice. Cool. Thank you, Cody. Um, so I'm thinking about appealing to rural voters, specifically ones who have voted Republican. And I work in the Appalachian region in eastern Kentucky. So this is an area um, in which a lot of uh, uh, hope has been lost in the political system in, in maintaining their jobs. And I feel like you know, a lot of people, they vote for uh, Republican candidates who use a lot of um, xenophobic or racist language. But when you actually talk to them, it, it comes down to usually economic issues. Um, and so I've been thinking about, uh, you know, appealing to this sort of shared frustration amongst progressives and conservatives about the elites. Right. There's this like a uh, Richmond North of Richmond song was huge amongst conservatives and 90 percent of it is seems to be uh, against uh, corporate elites and political elites, which, you know, I can get down with. And so thinking instead about uh, encouraging the creation of, of cooperative uh, cooperative economies on in within rural America and rural communities. And so I, I looked through and um, looked through the R&D and was happy to see that there was a bunch of lines talking specifically about land trusts, land trusts and cooperative ownership. So I'll just read out my question from here. Um, the R&D says um, it, it plans on encouraging land trusts and cooperative ownership. Is there a path towards establishing federal uh, slash state incubators for cooperative owned enterprises or land trusts? The incubators that would provide in initial capital, like get over that barrier, uh, like a low interest loan and trainings on operating cooperatives? And basically, what are the R&D's authors' thoughts on what encouraging cooperative economies means here? Um, I remember that Bernie, one of his policies in 2020, I believe it was, was to create a federal bank that would give loans to uh, help cooperative businesses start up, or I think they call them workers self-directed enterprises or something like that. But uh, is there anything akin to that um, policy-wise? Thank you. I'll try to jump in, Kevin. So um, as the the recommendations that are contained of, with each of the 10 pillars kind of vary from things that are already happening, that people have been testing on the ground. Some of them even have policy supporting them, like some of what's come out of Biden's administration around the IRA and rural investment, rural broadband. So some of them are there. Some are things that are more 
um, there's certainly a body of experience like land trusts and cooperative enterprises, but our country has generally not been friendly to worker cooperatives and to land trusts. There's There's been a movement for decades on both fronts. Part of what the Rural New Deal has not figured out in the particulars is how do we switch that? The, we have allies, um, Ruby does, people like Marjorie Kelly, who writes extensively about land trusts and worker ownership, Michael Schumann, who writes a lot about local economy and worker ownership, who have been working to create policy mechanisms where these things can start getting the support they deserve, because they're effective. Land trusts are one mechanism to keep the cost of land out of the hands of speculators, whether for housing or for productive, productive activities. So I, I guess the short answer is, the Rural New Deal itself does not prescribe specifics on the policy, but but we're real believers that this is part of real wealth accumulation and restoring access to people who've been shoved aside, whether whether they're white, Native American, African American. So we it's one of those areas where we need to really build out the particulars and find the creative policy solutions that would actually make it happen. Cool, thank you. And Anthony, what was that um, uh, author that you referenced? Uh, Marjorie Kelly. She's just got a new book out called Wealth Supremacy. And we're hoping to have her in, on one of our monthly briefings in the future. Steve, I, I'm, I'm not jumping you, Stu, Sue. I'll go to you next. Steve had his hand up and then, and then he got trigger happy. But Steve is back with his hand up. Go ahead, Steve. Yes, thank you. I, sorry about that. I had several questions which were answered. I have another question. So first of all, I want to say thank you to all of you. This is a great presentation. I really appreciate the work that you do. Um, one other thing that might be worth considering is there are campaigns that cut across urban and rural divisions that could benefit rural communities. And one of those is uh, Railroad Workers United's campaign calling for public ownership of the nation's rails. And this could definitely benefit rural communities because the Class 1 railroads have screwed over communities like East Palestine. So that's something I'd like you to consider. And if folks are curious, I'll drop the link to Railroad Workers United in the chat. And full disclosure, I am a solidarity member of that organization, even though I am a public transit worker on ferries, not railroads, although I did grow up in a railroad family and did for a time live in a rural community in Innis, Texas, which is now an exurb called Innis, Texas, which is south of Dallas. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. I'll just remind folks, especially if you're new, we do this every month. It's always a blast. Uh, typically, except for sometimes in January when it runs up against the holiday, but typically first Wednesday of the month at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Sue, go ahead. Um, yeah, thanks. So I do work for the, I'm not speaking for the California Democratic Party, but I'm the Northern Region Organizing Manager with the California Democratic Party. And I have been, we all, everyone thinks of California, of course, as very blue, why pay attention, whatever. But where I live and, and a big part of my job is work, how do we get into those rural areas? And so I think the work of Ruby is really great. This is a great conversation. My interest and what I have been more or less tasked with is how do we provide political cover? for candidates, Democrats in particular, in those rural areas. And so a lot of what you all are doing, which is absolutely fabulous work, is sort of the policy stuff and getting the parties to adopt and working with the committees and all of that stuff, which is fabulous. It's the right process. My interest and my work is how do I build a toolkit, for example, using these ideas so that we can get it into those rural areas? And, um, and, and, and for me, it's how do I provide political cover? Because in the areas where I work, got a lot of those, I mean, Shasta County, which got rid of the Dominion voting machine and wanted to hand count and all of that stuff, it, it's been taken over by MAGA. And so we can't even run candidates up there. So how do I use this in a way 
that I can provide cover that basically says Democrats don't eat our babies. A Democratic candidate should be paid attention to. So I'm just curious if that's the next step. If you have a toolkit in mind, because I plan to write my own and maybe if it's any good, share it with others. So thank you so much. I'd like to jump in on some of that, Sue. Great, great questions and totally relevant points. This Rural New Deal is part of Ruby's kind of research and analysis piece, much like what we did last year. I mean, totally different in the particulars when we released the Can Democrats Succeed in Rural America, which was focused on candidates. But that's a really small part of what we do, as, as important as it is. In fact, at the I think it's the 26th or so of October, I'm doing a, a, a miniature version of the training we do with local dams, with liberal and progressive organizations, with a group called Sierra Forward, which I think might overlap part of your area. So I'd love to have you join because part of what we'll be exploring is exactly what else Ruby offers that can help because we're, we've got a community works initiative that's doing practical work on the ground in rural places. We've got our training series, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the big picture policy stuff, as important as that is, is really just one of the legs of the stool that we have. And and can so so I'll just say that and say, let's connect and figure out other ways we can work with you as well. I can jump in here. I can let everybody know too that I've uh, changed locations. Of course, I'm now on. Uh, probably can probably familiar uh, at the at that view from a, a movie or two, um, and probably direct experience, I imagine. But um, the um, way in the back here. Um, so yeah, first of all, I, I should definitely connect with you um, uh, if you're involved with the California Democratic Party. I know a convention is coming up, and I'll be. Uh, I should be at that. And um, we, of course, will be looking for rural candidates at the federal level to lift this up. And we'll be sharing this uh, document with candidates across the country running in, um, you know, obviously, they wouldn't be challenging Democratic incumbents in most of those districts. We do have a champion down in uh, South, um, well, sort of South Central Eastern California and Derek Marshall, who got the party nomination last time and probably will again this time. But yes, um, it's it's tough. But um and one of the problems is, of course, the, the, the two-party system. You know, by the way, that phrase has sort of fallen out of favor. And I, I have a, you know, a sort of pragmatic um, motivation to revive it and bring it more into parlance. Um, obviously, you know, Cornell West, for instance, was a professor of mine when I was younger. I, you know, I think what he's doing can obviously introduce a bunch of great ideas. And then he can have consequences at the end of the election cycle, right? And um, so we live in, we are operating inside of what I was told when I was growing up in my civics classes, it's more or less a two-party system. It hasn't changed since then. All national elected officials are one or the other party with about five exceptions. Uh, and that's about the same ratio everywhere in the country where you are running in party-affiliated elections. So that's the reality. The progressive Democrats right now are a constitutively different wing of the party than the moderate Democrats. We even just saw this play out. If anybody wondered what happened with the California Senate, um, you know, announcement that Barbara Lee did not get, and you're wondering about the woman who did get it, that's because the person who got it is understood to be somebody who's in the whole channel of raising big corporate money for the Democratic Party, and Barbara Lee's a progressive. There's a big distinction. So one of the things that we can try to play on is that distinction. That can be a diff difficult thing, though, to highlight and raise if you're going to continue operating inside the Democratic Party. But maybe we just have to sort of, that's one strategy and way to approach it. But the other is just um, to start really lifting up progressive Democratic candidates in rural districts, because it is basically a void. The mainstream Democrats are gonna put no resources into those candidates that they nominate in those districts. And of course their policies are gonna have no traction in the areas because you know, Democratic neoliberalism has been a complete bankrupt um, set of policies for uh, rural and small town America. So, uh, yeah, I think there's different strategies. I'd love to work with how to achieve that in California rural districts and everywhere else across the country. Thanks. Sorry for the noise. I am so curious about Alan's seatmates right now. I'm going to ask a question that's more about the high level spirit thing. And then after the words, we'll do a we'll do a really uh, wonky policy specific one. But 
Fostering a sense of empowerment, here's the question. Fostering a sense of empowerment is really important in many places. How do you see going about doing that? Marilyn, I bet you have some examples of, of seeing that happen. Yeah, I mean, the first step of, of empowerment is engaging in dialogue, engaging in conversation. I've seen some of the kids kind of running through the chats about, you know, is is it basically is rural reachable is, uh, you know, what do we need to do? How do we need to... Um, approach this? And the answer is yes. Um, but it, it it starts with having opportunities to build trust and relationships and to, again, help people, um, help people know that they hold the solution for their own communities and giving people opportunities to express what their solutions look like um, which is something that um, I think a, a, a lot of folks in rural areas often lack when policies and, and good ideas are handed down. Um, they may be good ideas, but they're not they're not our ideas. They're not they're they don't have the flavor. They don't have the cultural um, significance. They don't have um, you, you know these 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 ho hooks into the into the place. So. Um, being able to open up those conversations and to rebuild the trust through um, tangible work that shows results um, that's not just um, talk and that the people in rural areas are actually involved in crafting i think is the is the approach i'll just add to that cody that i think an awful lot of people in rural areas largely believe if not totally believe reagan's admonition that the government is not the solution, the government is the problem. Changing that requires that from those of us on the left, we recognize that sometimes they're right. Sometimes the government passes really bad policies like NAFTA and, and China entering the WTO that in fact become part of the problem. And sometimes the government is just a bit bumbling in how they do it. So that's that's something we have to overcome. Because right now, people think, they don't think government and my empowerment or my community's well-being in the same breath. They see those as antagonistic. I think focusing on the success stories like Cofield and the hundreds of others around the country is one way to get people feeling like there's hope. Yeah. And then you can sort of attach the notion that, you know what, those groups also get they partner with the government to solve these problems, but put the local efforts first and then bring the government in rather than the other way around. There's also a really interesting parallel, you know, with government and corporations, right? We know that the, the, the corporate influence in government is, you know, it's almost indistinguishable sometimes which one you're talking to. In a lot of rural areas, the government hasn't always been helpful and corporations have often been damaging. And really what is, you know, aren't trustworthy. So when you combine those two things, just from an optics standpoint and a practicality standpoint, uh, you can really see why uh, trust levels in both are very low. We have about 1.3 million questions in the chat, and I am disappointed that we're not going to get to all of them. We're not done yet, but what I want to tell folks is if you email these questions to us, info at ruralurbanbridge.org or Cody at ruralurbanbridge.org, I get both of those. Uh, I will personally commit to spamming our panelists with those questions after the fact. So they have not agreed to that, but I will spam their inbox. Please send questions you really, really feel strongly about getting answered. And now we'll go to Beth, another person who will ask her question with her own voice. Thank you. I do live in a semi-rural area in Connecticut, and I'm taking a chance asking this question if you have any people that I can contact to work with them, because I think this is a great effort that you guys have put forward. And I used to do a lot of work in my community, and I've sort of lost contact with people. So do you have any names in, uh, I live in central Connecticut, central or eastern Connecticut, that I could reach out to? I'd appreciate it. Thank you. I, I don't know the answer to that right off, Beth. Nobody jumps out, but we'll kind of dig into, we have a subscriber list for Ruby that's uh, more than a couple thousand people, and we can see if there's somebody in your neighborhood, more than one, that you could try to hook up with. I did, did on that. It did on that, and we have a, a really large database, and 
innumerable people in Connecticut. We haven't had people in, in uh, focus on rural or small town policies in Connecticut, though. So we'll look into it. Thanks. I got to tell you, Alan, uh, several years back, I tried to start a group of PDA here in Connecticut, and I was sending out email blasts to like hundreds of people, and I never got anything developed. So I just want to let you know it's it's rough here. So. You know, you got a tough state to crack in terms of progressive politics and, you know, the, the moneyed interests in Connecticut have real grip on the upper, uh, higher office level holders in the state. So it's tough. I mean, not the worst lot, but there's not a lot of real progressives there yet. Well, there are, but it's just hard to organize them and get them working. That's, that's oh, the people I... are, the people are, but I mean, the frustration with getting them elected into Congress and the Senate and stuff would be, I can imagine it's very tangible. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Beth, I don't know if I'm uh, if this is a spoiler or not. I'm not sure if we sent it out yet, but we are either just or about to release a directory of organizations working in rural that uh, might be helpful there. So uh, if it's out, look for it. If it's about to come out, look for it when it comes out. Thank you. Here's a, a pretty in the weeds question, but I really like it because I stumble across this all the time. How do you deal with building restrictions that work against environmental changes and encourage the status quo like fossil fuel drilling or coal mining? Um, you know, one of the things about that, and uh, obviously with oil and gas and chemical workers union, is one of the highest paid um, average union positions, pretty, you know, you go across the various unions in the country. I think the Major League Baseball Players Association has slightly higher salaries, but other than that, it's one of the highest in the country. So, one of the things that's really incumbent upon, obviously, again, the progressive Democrats within our two party system taking the lead and making it real is this concept of a just transition. It's been great to see the way that, that UAW leadership has leaned into that uh, as a major talking point in the strike that's ongoing with UAW. Um, but um, it's a tough one, of course, and it's been a real um, uh, problem. But with the Blue Green Alliance and such, there's been some headway made, even with some of those unions. And to, you know, the Teamsters are sort of coming around too. But obviously, these we're not talking just about union considerations when we're talking about those questions. And it's obviously a huge, huge, huge global and national issue. Um, I don't know if people saw the 2025 um, heritage. Um, foundation policy template for the next Republican president <laughs> on climate. It just has one line that really stands out, reverse everything the Democrats did while they're in office and just go right back to it. And of course, it'll generate some money for some people. Um, and there'll be some spillover into communities from that money. And it can be difficult when there's no other positive progressive economic programs or positive economic programs that reach those community members. So we, you know, I, I do think, um, by the way, the locally led federal supporting, <laughs> I suppose, you know, Anthony did say that a few minutes ago. I sort of look at it more balanced. Um, I do think making, there's a role that I play. I'm not the person who communicates with the rank and file people in rural communities. Everything that's being said about local, the local out is accurate, but the temp, a controversial point. But, um, you know, I mean, you know, it is really incumbent upon something like PDA to get AOC to support this, to get the urban core progressives to have part of their national policy positions to support for a rural new deal, because we need the votes to pass it and free up all the money that these federal programs can make. Masking the fact that it will be anchored by federal programs and emphasizing the local thing, that's a very, very smart, pragmatic component. But I don't think you can downplay the you know federal macroeconomic component of this uh, as it's proposed sorry i have to go everybody i love you all and i'm I, as anthony knows i've never been more thrilled about any project i've worked on since uh, since i've had this job at pda it's an honor to work with all of you so thank you thank you alan Apparently, we've gone way over time, and that's entirely my fault for just lack of attention to detail. Uh, I think this is a great question to end on. What do you expect to be the next steps with regard to the Rural New Deal? What are you asking those participating in the in this event to do? Well, I can start that unless you want to jump in first, Marilyn. 
Um, I'm sorry. What what was the question again? Like what are next steps? Yeah. What do we expect next steps for the rural yeah. New Deal to be? And what are we asking folks in the room to do? Yeah, yeah I think continuing to to continue to educate ourselves as to what is really going on on the ground in our rural communities, not just, you know, the Midwestern farm communities, um, but other air, urban areas where ag is is uh, not maybe front and center, but, you know, fossil fuel transition might be, or some other decline in a, in a uh, resource based uh, sector, really um, listening to rural people engaging, uh, bringing people to into the conversations uh, in all the ways which I know this does, which is which is great and uh, continuing to to uplift the stories uh, and in potential candidates and folks that are um, able to to make the difference and cut through the emotional um, the winds that are blowing right now. And uh, that's, you know, that that's widening the rural urban divide and, you know, focusing on highlighting, lifting up where where the winds are blowing, maybe a little bit less. And we're seeing some healing and some opportunities um, to put aside labels and and really help people transform their lives into ones that are, are thriving. So I'll I'll say that I think uh, there's several steps. One is. Ruby will help with this, but we're not we're not the clearinghouse. But one is to educate yourself about the success stories. So check out Cofield's website. And if you go to the website of the Just Transition Fund, you'll find out about a lot of other groups, all of which are rural and but they're in post coal economy communities. So it's not all of America, but you get a really good sampling of some outstanding groups there. And then like Amy Adams put in the chat that they have a kind of a repository that they've developed for Iowa where they're highlighting projects of this nature. So again, the more we know about the real work happening rural, the more places we can put our own support, but especially encourage our elected representatives to support those kinds of things. That would be one. Second thing is just pass around the Rural New Deal to your friends, especially, especially if you're in urban and suburban areas, um, especially if you're connected to a political party or a indivisible chapter or our revolution. All of those great folks usually don't have a good handle, often don't have a good handle in rural. So use the Rural New Deal as a tool to educate your friends and colleagues, I would say, is a is another really good thing. And then for us, the the next step is really to begin to think through how we implement this on the ground. Like how do we begin to build political force behind us so that these policies will in fact be adopted if they haven't already been. And we think that part of the way we do that is again by surfacing the, the examples, the success stories and connecting them to policymakers. Ruby itself can't go directly to candidates or to campaigns but we're gonna to try to get the people who can to start lifting up the Rural New Deal as, as an example of really good policy that they should support. And we need your help doing it. Thank you to the panelists. Of course, we've lost Alan, his plane has taken off. Um, Marilyn, I think there's some questions about uh, the link to, there it is, great. You you went there before I went there. Um, I'm going to have that that concludes the event on the Rural New Deal. Thank you all for being here. Once again, if you didn't get your question answered, and I know many of you did not, email me and I'll do my best. Uh, Erica, can you come off mute and talk about next month's session? Mm, yes, indeed. 